Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're going to be covering how I composed, sketched and orchestrated the piece you're listening to right now which is Quirky. There's a link in the description in case you want to check it out. This piece was commissioned to me for a project that ended up falling flat so I had a bit of a briefing with regards to what I was meant to deliver. The piece was meant to be an opening cue about 15 seconds long for a comedic show. The goals I had in mind involved first off creating a musical language for the show, a musical universe, and second coming up with a hook or theme that would be like the show's signature. The first thing I did was determine the palette, the musical palette, which tools I would be using to come up with this musical universe. Now I knew from the get-go that I wanted to go for an orchestral sound, so having the instrument's palette clear then I would move on to determining the actual musical palette, the musical elements. This has a lot to do with the way you musically perceived a particular vibe. As I was saying before, this was meant to be a comedy show, so I would want the vibe to come across as quirky, extravagant, kind of rhythmic but not percussion driven while also keeping the full orchestra sound. I guess this is kind of personal but there are certain musical colours that I perceive as comedic or extravagant. Among these elements I would find major chords that are a triton apart for instance, augmented chords, diminished chords, certain use of medians, certain chords planning and certain uses of the Dorian and Lydian modes. But most importantly what gives it that comedic sound is not the elements in and on themselves but the way you mix them, the way you make them work with each other. With regards to the theme, I knew it was going to be a very short theme, not only because the music cue was meant to be about 15 seconds long, but because a theme, in order to be perceived as a theme, needs repetition. And we are talking about 15 seconds overall here. In these kind of pieces where the approach is more modal rather than tonal, especially when they're rhythmic, I find it easier building the background texture first and then coming up with the melody. A melody that fits that particular background texture. So with all that in mind, let's move on to seeing what I actually ended up doing. In order to address the rhythmic approach I wanted to achieve, I ended up going for a very simple ostinato. It's literally one note, as you can see. And in order to emphasize that quirkiness, I wanted to keep the piece as off the beat as possible. Or rather than off the beat, I wanted the piece to be perceived as not having a regular beat. In terms of harmony, the first four chords summarize pretty much 80% of what's going on harmonically in this piece. The first chord is a C major chord which serves as tonal or rather modal center and is followed by an F sharp major chord and a B flat major chord before returning back to C major. The F sharp major chord is a triton away from the original C major chord and a B flat major chord belongs with the Dorian mode of C. If we take a look at the next chord sequence, we can see how it's fairly similar, the only difference here being an augmented F chord that resolves towards a B flat major chord that goes back to C. Further along, we can see a C diminished that goes to an F sharp major that goes back to C major. As you can see, many of these chord space is not the root of the chord, which has to do with voice leading. After that we find E flat minor followed by G flat major, which are just a succession of medians. Later on we find A flat major that goes to G flat major that goes back to C major. So up until now you could argue that the only thing I've been doing is borrowing chords from the Dorian and Locrian modes of C. Up next we find a D major that goes to a C major. A sort of a Lydian flavor here. Then there's a D major that goes to a C major that goes to a B flat major that goes to a G flat major. This might sound a bit messy but it's just planning for the first three chords and then a median between the third and the fourth chords. Finally there's an A flat major that goes to an F major that goes back to C major which is just a median move followed by a plagal cadence to give it more of the modal flavor. Now I want to point out that this is just me analysing what I've done in hindsight. I don't go about this thinking in these terms but rather playing around and finding what 
I think fits best intuitively. That's why it's very important to familiarize yourself with these flavors, to get them under your fingers. So when you are playing around on the keyboard, you come up with them naturally. In terms of structure, this piece is very simple. It starts off with a brief introduction, establishing the harmonic colors and the background texture and rhythm before the theme pops up for the first time. After that, the theme pops up a second time. And from here till the end is just a build up towards the last chord. There are two tiny melodies during that build up. This is because I felt that the theme needed an answer, a sort of B part to balance it out. Other than that, there's a run here, which is just an octatonic scale, but that's about it. In terms of fleshing out the actual arrangement, I'd make sure that the voicings are the way I want them to be, and that certain elements are doubled up or down an octave as I see fit. By this point, I'd have a rough idea of which instrument family is going to play what, but it won't be until the next step, orchestration, where I'll decide what's going to go to each individual instrument. As far as orchestration goes, I knew that I wanted to hold off the tutti texture right until the end. And at the same time, I wanted the orchestration to come across as exuberant and showy. One of the main guiding principles for this is that any line, melody or chord or anything really that can be done with two elements instead of one should be done with two. And anything that could be done with three elements instead of two should be done with three. At the same time, the pace at which these colors change is of utmost importance. You want to avoid sameness at all costs, basically. For instance, at the beginning, the ostinato is on the strings, then it moves onto the flutes and trumpets and then goes back to the strings. Another example would be the melodies. The first statement of the theme is played by the woodwinds and the trumpet joins in halfway through. The second statement is played by the strings with some clarinet doubling. This tiny third melody is played by trumpets and trombones. And the last one is played by horns. One last example about this would be the runs. The first run is played by the clarinets and the second run is played by the full strings ensemble and the woodwind section. So as you can see, you don't hear the same combination of instruments twice. This principle about keeping it as far as possible not only applies to which instruments are going to be playing what, but how they're going to be playing it. For instance, if we're talking about strings, are we talking about longs or maybe tremolos? If we're talking about brass, are we talking about frullato, normal longs or maybe mutes? And another thing is that these combinations don't have to be static. Certain instruments can jump in or out of a certain element or can start playing one articulation and then move on to another one. All that as well as doubling things up or down an octave dynamically or statically or even the possibility of highlighting just certain notes within a line instead of the whole thing. When you factor all that in, the amount of possible combinations grows exponentially. And the way you handle all those possibilities is, in my honest opinion, what makes an arrangement pop. Now, this is not to say that everything might work. You have to know the particularities of each individual instrument. For instance, if you had a line played by the horns in the middle of the register on a fortissimo dynamic, and you wanted to double that up with the flute in the first octave of the register, that might be a possibility, but it would be a useless possibility. Because the flutes are extremely weak in the register and wouldn't be heard at all. That's why it's very important to study thoroughly each individual instrument. Finally, I tend to add the percussion right at the end. This is because the percussion in this piece in particular is not driving the piece along at all. Its role is merely decorative, if you will. So what I tend to do with it is make the most of it and add an extra layer of variability to all the combinations we were talking about earlier. For instance, at the beginning, I use the tempo blocks to give the ostinato a bit of texture. Both the xylophone and the glockenspiel are used to double up certain lines to give them that extra variability. And the suspended symbol is used to emphasize the build-up of the runs. 
But once again, the amount of combinations at your disposal is limitless. So that's about it. In this video, I won't be talking about production, MIDI programming, mixing or mastering. If you're interested in how I approach those topics, I recommend you check out the videos linked in the description. I hope that was clear and helpful and please feel free to ask me anything in the comment section. Thanks for listening and cheers!